Fantastic. Can you all see that okay? Yep, that's perfect. Wonderful. So good afternoon, everyone. I hope you've been enjoying the BNA members meeting so far. As Emma kindly introduced, I'm Lizzie English. I'm a PhD student at the University of Cambridge, and I'll be chairing this session for today. For accessibility, I'll also share a quick audio description of myself. So I'm a white cisgender woman in my early 20s with long dark hair, glasses and a white shirt. I'd like to also reinforce that everybody is very welcome to join this session. Whether you identify as a female, non-binary person or male, it is very important that we have everybody involved in these discussions that affect our research culture. We'd like this to be a very interactive session. So to kick off, please do introduce yourself in the chat. For example, let us know where you're joining from or what area of neuroscience you study. It's great to have you here and thank you very much for coming along. Um, we should also have a very quick poll coming up on the screen shortly to start our discussions. Fantastic. So yes, this poll is simply asking, have you noticed any gender biases while working in neuroscience? So no might suggest that you think all genders are being treated equally in our field and you haven't noticed any gender bias in our culture or in scientific trials, for example. Um, whereas yes might mean that you personally experience bias or you may have unknowingly applied it to others or you might have noticed other people in your workplace exposed to this bias. Fantastic. So I'll just give you a couple of seconds to finish answering that. Wonderful. So if we could close the poll now, that would be great. Interesting. OK, so we have a mixture there. Um, most of you have said yes, that you have noticed gender bias in neuroscience. I'm interested to see that some of you have said no as well. So I'm curious to see whether your thoughts might change throughout this session as you learn more from our panelists and other people in the audience. It would be great if you did say yes to elaborate on this in the chat box. So if you're comfortable sharing your experiences of gender bias in neuroscience and how you might have been treated differently due to your gender or how you've noticed others being treated differently. So whilst you're doing this, I'm very keen to introduce our panel for today. Uh, we have Professor Gina Rippon, Tommy Akingbade, Professor Selena Ray, and Dr. Emma Weinel, all inspirational women in neuroscience from a variety of backgrounds, neuroscience fields, and career stages. And they show all of us that it is possible for women to pursue careers in neuroscience. However, do we think that enough is being done for women to be able to pursue these careers and to be satisfied and successful in their work? During this session, we hope to discuss some of the barriers that face women in neuroscience today, identifying what could be done on a personal and a more systemic level to help tackle gender bias in our research culture. So this is a one hour session. Firstly, I'll be introducing each panelist individually, briefly discussing their career progression and some of the opportunities and challenges that they face along the way during their career. And then for the second part of the session, we're hoping to join together in a panel discussion, likely surrounding some of the barriers that women in science come up against and covering some of the ideas for how we might be able to minimize these in the future. So throughout the session, please do submit your questions for our panelists in the Zoom Q&A function, and we'll be selecting a few of these for our panel discussion later on. And as I said, feel free to use the chat function for anything that isn't specifically a question. So in the chat, you could leave some comments on the session, you could talk about your experiences of gender bias in science, and it will be interesting to see if you have ideas for tackling these as well. Um, so make sure you stick around till the end of the session, as I also have some support networks to share some schemes that support women and other underrepresented groups in science, including an exciting new network that I've established called Women in Neuroscience UK. But firstly, without further ado, I'm very pleased to welcome our first panellist, Professor Gina Rippon. So I'll just try and change the slide. There we go. Wonderful. So Professor Gina Rippon is an Emeritus Professor of Aston University in Birmingham. I decided Professor Rippon was an ideal panellist for this session. Not only is she a feminist with a long successful career in neuroscience, she also has specific research interests in understanding the impacts of life experience as well as biology on the development of the brain and on gender bias. 
Gina's a board member of Neurogenderings, which is a transdisciplinary network of researchers interested in this relationship between gender and the brain. And in 2019, Gina published the very insightful book, Gendered Brain, the new neuroscience that shatters the myth of the female brain. So I'm very looking forward to hearing Gina's insights on the potential causes of gender bias in society and in our scientific research culture more specifically. Thank you very much for joining us today, Gina. It's great to see you. Thank you very much for uh, asking me, Lizzie. It's a great, a great panel. Um, and just to introduce myself to everybody, as Lizzie's already indicated, I'm a emeritus professor of neuroimaging. I'm also um, described myself as an older white English speaking female. Um, and uh, over back to Lizzie to ask me the questions you might want. As indicated, there is a very long career progression shown on this slide. Um, I didn't realize quite how far, far back it went. And um, so I'm clearly in the uh, uh, later, very later career research uh, slot here. Yes, it's fantastic to have you here and hear about your experiences, Gina, it's wonderful. So I wanted to start our discussion with you on something that is very interesting to me and perhaps unexpected. This is the gender equality paradox. So this is a phenomenon that's discussed in several recent academic papers, and it refers to countries that are often deemed the most equal in gender, in fact, having larger gender disparities by some measures, for example, with lower representation of women in science, the opposite to what we might expect. So I'd be very interested to hear why you think this might be happening. We have a few slides as well to supplement Gina's discussion here. Yes, thank you very much, Lizzie. Um, well, I've been given the virtually impossible task of talking about the gender equality paradox in about five minutes. So quickly, to put in your science spin on the issue, the gender equality paradox, as indicated, is the suggestion that uh, it is somehow unusual that in the supposedly gender equal countries, there is proportionally a greater underrepresentation. Of women in science and I called this a new entry in an old playbook because the idea about women in science uh, earlier on in, in history was that they didn't do science because they couldn't do science um, and this was an essentialist argument and we're now seeing a, a emergence of a new essentialist version namely that women don't do science because they choose not to do science and now that in some countries, and inverted commas, um, there is a level playing field <laughs> for science in countries like the Scandinavian countries and Iceland, there is still evidence that women are choosing not to do science, and this has been given an essentialist spin. So just quickly to give my take on somewhere else we should be looking with an explanation for this, is to remind people that we now know that our brains are wired to make us social. We know that uh, if we experience negative, have negative social experiences, that they have very profound effects on our self-esteem. Um, and I've just quickly indicated um, some of the new research, research going along with this, that. Um, if we are experience negative aspects of our self-identity or some form of social rejection or damage to our self-image or some form of criticism or making an, a mistake and, and being held accountable for it, those areas of the brain which are also associated with real pain, uh, real pain are those areas which are activated. So negative social experiences have a very uh, profound effect on brain activity. And if, as Lizzie's now said, she's put the next part of the, the slide up, it also has a profound impact on aspects of behavior. And this is linked to some of the clinical work I've been doing. Um, if we could go back, Lizzie, I think. Yes, sorry. All right, yeah. <laughs> okay. Um, just to say that associated with negative social experiences, behaviorally, there's evidence of poor self-image, high rejection sensitivity, so a, a particular take that people have on a culture they find themselves in and they, they, they become concerned that they don't fit, they don't belong, they're going to be rejected. High levels of self-criticism in the face of, of continuous negative social experience. And also in, in the clinical field, something which is known as self-silencing, where effectively individuals 
um, no longer uh, impose themselves as an individual in a social situation, they may withdraw completely. And in academic settings, this has been shown to women who uh, withdraw, fail to seek any, any help. So just to say that negative social experiences have quite a profound effect on the brain and on the behavior. And if we could then go on to the next slide, and this is where I'm going to get Lizzie because <laughs> quickly. The question is how paradoxical is the gender equality paradox? Are we actually saying that A, um, France does have a living level playing field, the more gender equal country, uh, countries are, the more level is science is playing field. That is something that hasn't been challenged and that's the basis of what I'm talking about today. I'm saying that there is no evidence of science um, being more gender, a more gender equal country um, means that science has a level playing field. And what about has been called science's glass obstacle course. In the last minute or so, I'm just going to quickly show some ideas of those areas that we might need to think about within science as a culture where individuals um, might feel they don't fit, might feel there's a, a, a kind of belief that they don't belong, um, might encounter stereotypes of various kinds. So in the top left hand corner, we've got the idea that there are, of course, clear stereotypes that women don't do science. And these are still evident uh, in, the, um, in the environment today. So for example, we can see from a university website when they're advertising experts within astronomy and space research, or um, puzzled looking male. Um, there's also the idea that perhaps in order to be some kind of genius to achieve great success in certain disciplines, there's a belief you have to be born to be a genius. And those disciplines which have the strongest evidence of that kind of belief are also the, uh, the disciplines with the greatest underrepresentation of women in science. Um, there is also a rogues gallery, uh, which is uh, occasional public outbursts from male figures who should know better with respect to whether or not women should actually be encouraged to do science. Um, and James Damore, the Google memo writer, uh, Alessandro Strumi, a physicist, uh, renowned, as I say, um, public outcries. Um, just to mention yesterday, some of you may well be aware that sadly, um, this rogues gallery has been joined by a female, a head teacher, who was giving evidence to a government um, panel on the underrepresentation. Well, it was on diversity and inclusion in STEM subjects. Um, and uh, dismissed in a, in a way that was has been termed outrageous, ignorant and complacent to the fact that only 16% of her girls were doing physics and thought it might guessed it might be because they didn't want to do the hard maths. So sorry about that. If we could just have the other two aspects, just to say there's some, if you know, if you're in a in a culture where as a female you're hugely underrepresented, then you are likely to be lacking in, in role models and that really been shown to be very important in progress in science. Um, journals, uh, particularly the Native Spring and Nature group, have started to acknowledge that, you know, journal publications, citations, etc., an indication of um, success and a measure of success as clear evidence of gender bias within those fields. And finally, in physics has also started looking at sexist, sexist gender harassment as opposed to the kind of Me Too type version where if people in their daily workplace constantly um, come across sexist beliefs about their ability, they're much more likely to have a negative sense of belonging. And um, it is a very powerful predictor of the imposter phenomenon. So I'm aware I've gone over my time, sorry, Lizzie. But it Absolutely was just to say, <laughs> that is just to say, this is a it's been defined as a paradox. It's a new essentialist argument. As you can probably tell, I think there are very many other areas that we should be looking at. And as a society, it's, it's something that uh, we can do something about. So great that there is this kind of panel to draw our attention to. Absolutely. So Thank you very much. Thank you, Gina. Thank you for the context. I'm sure we'll come back to some of this later in the panel discussion as well. So next, I would like to welcome Tommy Akingbade. She is a first year PhD student at the University of Cambridge, studying inflammation in Alzheimer's disease. Thank you very much for coming along today, Tommy. 
Hi, um, thank you for having me. Um, as Lizzie has mentioned, my name is Tommy Akinbade. My pronouns are she, her. Um, I'm a black cisgendered woman in my 20s. I'm wearing a black jumper and my afro is tied back in a bun. Um, and yeah, as Lizzie has said, I'm a first year PhD student at the University of Cambridge. My project right now is focused on investigating the inflammatory response in neurodegenerative diseases. And I am also the proud founder of the Black Women in Science Network. Yeah, so thanks, Lizzie. Thanks for having me. I'm excited to be here. Yes, fantastic. Thank you for coming along. Um, I asked Tommy to join the panel today because I think she provides a really valuable, unique viewpoint as a young Black woman in science. Despite her early career stage, Tommy has wide scientific experience, having worked in both the NHS and academia. And as she mentioned, during her integrated master's course, Tommy noticed the lack of representation of people who look like her in science and took the great initiative to create the, the Black Women in Science Network. This network provides a safe space for support and encouragement of Black women in science through social media, blogs, and regular online events. So Tommy, you speak really openly online about your experiences as a Black woman in science, which I think is really important and it's great to see. It would be amazing if you could tell us a little bit more about your experiences and what you think are the barriers that are continuing to impact Black women in science. Yeah, so that's a great kind of question and it's a really important thing that I think to discuss. Um, before I get into it, and you can stop me whenever because I can go on for a while um I'd like to disclaim that I am just one black woman in science I don't speak for absolutely everyone I do have the unique vantage point in which a lot of the work I do do through the black women in science network means that I interact with a lot of black women who are in general science and in neuroscience as well um but to answer that question from my point of view I think I try to think of um my the interaction with a scientific career at three levels I think of it access retention and progression and those are three huge stumbling blocks I think that um, are ways that people could potentially leave um, leave science and some of the barriers that people face so thinking about access first of all um, representation representation is a huge huge um, it's a hugely important thing that I think that we um, people have started to emphasize a lot more now and people are um, aware of how important it is to have representation. Um, something I like to do sometimes when I come on these things is ask the audience to um, name a, in this occasion, a black female neuroscientist who is visible either in Psycom or Twitter online and just that's one bit, that's one thing you can do to like increase representation, just say people's names and um, get their work out there. Um, and it's amazing to see that. I can see some people putting stuff in the chat. That's amazing. Thank you. Um, yeah, so um, a huge barrier to access is um, representation and um, Gina touched on it um, from the early age of secondary school and access in science and realising that there's a career path there for you. Um, all of those things I think can um, be touched on and somewhat remedied by representation um, and also encouragement from young teachers, etc. Um, thinking about retention, um, this is a path that I'm quite passionate about. Um, a stage of career that I'm quite passionate about because I've just recently um, gone through like a stint of struggling to get a PhD position. Um, is a huge barrier facing black women is retention and staying in science. Um, as we know with science, there are lots of short-term contracts. You need to apply for your masters. You might want to apply for your PhD, you're applying for grants, et cetera, things like that. And um, all of these processes that you just may not know how to navigate because you've just never had exposure to it and you're not aware of it. Um, initiatives may not be accessible to you um, for different instances so that's a that's another potential barrier as well and um, it kind of it's kind of similar when you get to the points of progression um, post PhD in my experience I'd like to stay in science possibly academia um, but are the grant application process processes going to accommodate to um, certain barriers that I face etc those are all things that I need to think about and the potential barriers that I will face in my career and I know that other black women face it as well. Absolutely. Thank you for highlighting those, Tommy. That's really useful. And again, I'm sure we'll talk more about that later on. But next we have, I can move the slides along. There we go. Professor Selena Ray. Hi, Selena. Hi, everyone. Thank you for coming along today. Um, so to introduce you, I'd like to say that your career history is really inspiring to me personally. So Selena's managed to work her way from growing up on free school meals in Barnsley to a professorship in molecular neuroscience at University College London, which is incredible. Um, her lab group now use patient derived stem cell models to investigate various forms of dementia. And as well as her lab work, Selena is often found involved in science communication and 
outreach as well. So she has a very active presence on Twitter, which I think is great. And she's also involved in science art projects such as Neuronal Disco. So Selena, I'd be really interested to hear more about your experience as a woman in science coming from a low income background. So I wondered if you think your gender and financial situation have created any additional barriers to your success in neuroscience. Absolutely. And first of all, let me start by introducing myself. So just to um, say that I'm a cisgendered white woman, I'm wearing a black top, blonde hair tied back in a bun. And as of yesterday, I'm in my early 40s now. Um, and I can't think of a better way to start my 40s than participating in a panel discussion like this one. So thank you so much for inviting me. Um, so yeah, as, as, as Lizzie said, I came from quite an underprivileged background and, and, you know, my expertise on this is really based on my own lived experience. So again, I don't claim to speak for everyone and certainly the definition or idea of what it means to be from a working class background is something that has, has evolved over time as well. Um, but for me, when I talk about being underprivileged, I mean being a first generation student. So the first person in my family to leave Barnsley, the first person to go to university. I grew up, as Lizzie said, with free school meals, free um, school uniforms and, you know, was only able to really start on this journey because of things like no tuition fees and you know low student loans at the time so it's it's kind of a very different situation to what we have now and I think there's a lot of intersection there with the challenges of being a woman in science and I have to say from my own experience it's actually been from this low income background that has been something that I've been more aware of or something that I was aware of earlier because at each stage of my career, I've been really fortunate to be surrounded by a strong network of peers um, where we would have shared experiences as women in science, but the being from a low income background was something that was unique to me within my group. I don't, I don't claim to have a unique situation on the whole, but within my kind of peer support group. And it's something that I really first became aware of at university on a social level when, you know, you're in halls of residence, you're making friends and everyone is bonding over the skiing trips they went on at winter. I always use that example and I really have nothing against people who go skiing. It's just an easy example for me to use. And you sort of, you have this sense of being othered that you don't have anything to contribute to that situation. Now, of course, in terms of friendships, that's fine. You find your tribe, you find the people with, with shared experience and common interests, but they also leak into your professional life. So when it came to summer holidays, I was holding down two jobs just to survive and supplement a student loan where my peers would be gaining work experience in their dad's company or with their uncle's company. And I think that is the first um, step where I really realized that was going to be a barrier to my progression because you know we are judged on the experience we have to get to each stage but how can you get that experience unless you're given the opportunities so something that was really transformative for me at university was the ability to do a paid internship and I stress paid because I think you know unpaid internships favor privilege and abuse labor rights I really you know, think that having the ability to spend time in a lab and to be paid for that really set me on, on the track that I'm on now. It was really transformative. And it's something that I've tried to carry through into what I do now. How can we change our recruitment and retention policies so they give, you know, we're not putting the onus on the, the people who are in a minority group to do the heavy lifting themselves. We're changing the system so that we can make it fair to all so for example there are a number of great schemes now I know we're going to hear about some of them later but also things like into science that aims to get underprivileged and people from underprivileged backgrounds to to have experience so that it will then enhance their applications for universities you know we try to change our recruitment processes so I'll, I'll give one example that I was just on a panel recruiting for PhDs and as well as looking at their experience, we also asked the applicants to think of a challenge in science that they thought was, you know, the, the biggest, one of the biggest challenges facing society. And that really allows us to look at someone's potential rather than the opportunities that they've had. Um, it's difficult to completely separate these things, but, you know, we're thinking of small ways that we can integrate 
positive change into the system, hopefully to make it more equal for all. Um, and I think I, I, I've been rambling on a little bit, Lizzie, so I'll stop there. I'll pause for breath. <laughs> You're all right. That was wonderful. Really good to hear. Thank you, Selena. Um, I'm sure we'll talk to you more later. But finally, we'll move on to Emma. So there we go. So Dr. Emma Weinel um, is our final panellist. Thank you for joining us. Thank you for having me. It's great. Wonderful. OK, so I'll talk a little bit about Emma's history. So after completing a PhD in behavioural neuroscience, Emma worked as a research fellow, including working at a clinic involving those impacted by Huntington's disease. Emma now works at um, University of Cardiff as a senior lecturer in the School of Biosciences. And she is also very involved in science communication. She's won awards for it. She's presented at countless lectures, shows and festivals, as well as her blog and social media. So I asked Emma specifically to join the panel today because she is also the Equal Opportunities and Diversity Representative for the BNA and has held this role since 2019. So Emma, I would love to hear from you if you know a bit more about what the BNA are doing to support women in neuroscience. Thanks, Lizzie. Yeah, so just to introduce myself, uh, I'm a white cisgendered um, female. I've got long, uh, dark brown hair that's curled uh, today, and I'm wearing um, a black and white stripy jumper. So thank you for that, Lizzie. As you said, this is a role that I um, took on in 2019, and I uh, am really keen that it's a, it's a big role. It encompasses lots of different um, issues and topics in terms of equality and diversity and inclusion. But just to kind of touch on some of the um, things that the BNA have in place. And also, I did want to say that we're very keen to work with our members. We're really open to suggestions for the future as well. So if anybody does have any suggestions or any ways which you think we can improve um, or that we need to review, please do get in touch um, with us. That's really important to us. So, for example, for the BNA to um, endorse or fund or participate in a meeting, um, it's our expectation that at least a third of the total number um, of speakers at a meeting should be women. Um, individual sessions in, in multi-session uh, meetings or conferences um, or committees shouldn't exclusively um, be populated by men, for example. And that can lead to some quite challenging and difficult conversations. Um, but we, you know, really value and, and stick to our rules. So we think this is, is really, really important. Another um, area within the BNA that I wanted to mention was our carers grants as well. So our carers grants we've introduced to enable um, anybody who has caring responsibilities to uh, help them in attending conferences. And we recognise that often caring responsibilities do fall uh, on the shoulders of women that anybody can apply for the caring responsibility grants. And we were, um, when we set those up, we were very um, clear that we wanted to keep that caring responsibility um, definition very broad because we recognize that lots of people have different caring responsibilities, whether that be you know, child care or caring for maybe elderly uh, parents or other family members, for example. And something that was really important was that that caring grant can be used very flexibly. So whether that's paying for, I don't know, um, nursery fees or, or transport um, or all of these things. So we hope that that goes some way in, in helping and improving things. There's always uh, much more we can do. Um, but that is just one example that I wanted um, to draw everybody's attention to. Fantastic. Thank you, Emma. That's really useful. So that is all of our panellists introduced. So I'll try to stop sharing now. Fantastic. And we'll bring everybody together to start our panel discussion. So if you could continue to keep leaving your questions in the Q&A box, um, please keep them concise if you can, and also upvote the questions which you'd like most to be answered via the thumbs up button so we can read out the most highly voted questions for the panel to answer. Um, meanwhile, you're of course free to keep using the chat function as well to talk at more length if it's not specifically a question. Fantastic. So I'm going to kick off with a general question to the panellists while I work my way through the questions and try to pick some. Um, so firstly, I'd like to ask all of you for general ideas that you have um, that might be able to help increase the retention of women in neuroscience. 
Fab, I'll start with Selena. <laughs> um, yeah, I think I noticed this was mentioned in the chat as well, and I think it's really important thinking about retention and also progression. Um, and I, I'll come back to this idea of, of changing the system rather than changing the person. I think we hear a lot of discussion around mentoring, which is really useful, but you can't mentor yourself out of a crappy system. You need sponsors. So you need people who will put you forward for awards, for promotion, who will write those letters of recommendation. And that's very different to mentoring. And then for those of us like myself, who are fortunate enough to be in, in tenured positions where we can really push for change at lower risk to ourselves, I think we need to think about changing the system. One example that we've done through our Athena Swan network, which I think is, is really positive, is to actually make the discussion of promotion mandatory in appraisals. So then it means it's not on, it's not the responsibility of the individual to ask because some people might not ask for it as easily or feel that they can. It actually has to be signed off by the line manager that we have discussed whether now is the time to go for promotion. So they're, they're my few thoughts. Mm, that's really interesting, fantastic. Um, Emma, do you have something to add? Thank you, yeah, I wanted to jump in and, and mention because I do lots of work with um, schools engagement, getting um, girls and, and younger people um, involved and interested in, in science and neuroscience. And sometimes people say, you know, that's great work and there's been lots of great initiatives in this area. Um, but effectively, what is the point in that if all the, the girls and women drop out of science um, as they, they progress in their scientific careers? And that has always been a, a, a challenge to me. Um, and I think, you know, we have done great work in getting more girls interested in science at school. But it, it needs to be said, you know, if we're losing them all um, later down the line, then effectively that work um, is kind of limited in, in the benefit that it brings. Um, so that's another reason I think the retention um, of women in science is so important. Absolutely. Gina, would you like to go next? Oh, you're, you, you're muted, sorry. There we go. You say you can guess what I'm going to say. Um, I mean, I think absolutely there should be as much support as possible for individuals already in the system to make sure they stay there. But I would say it's not just to focus on the individual. They shouldn't have to do the heavy lifting. I think we need to look at the system as well. So, I mean, I mentioned the whole kind of reward system and, you know, who gets cited, who gets published, etc. So I think a, the system, that system needs to be looked at, but also to make sure that everybody, um, you know, under of whatever kind of underrepresentation in science has access to the proper access to those reward systems. And that, that, you know, that's part of the mentoring they have is how to, I don't like to use the word game the system, but possibly game the system. Yeah, fantastic. That's really interesting. OK, so I don't know if it's just on my Zoom, but we only seem to have one question in the Q&A box. Is that right? Yeah, OK, fantastic. Yes, we will be looking at the numbers of female and male three, the ratio at the end of the session, hopefully, if the BNA are able to record that sort of information, because that will be interesting to see. Um, if the BNA will be able to do a poll on that now, that would be fantastic. Um, We shall see. <laughs> okay, Emma, do you have something? Yeah. To oh, there we go. Oh, there we go. We speak. Um, and I just wanted to, to comment on that question that comes in um, about um, males, females joining us today, and to say that I've been really um, fortunate, I guess, to have had some fantastic um, mentors and, and sponsors who are men who recognise the importance. Um, of encouraging and, and supporting women. And I think it's really important that we involve men in the conversation uh, in this area as well. Absolutely, that's really important to emphasize. Okay, have we got the results from that poll? Interesting, okay, fantastic. So we have got a mixture, that's good to see. Thank you very much if you're not female for coming along especially. It's great to have you here.
Wonderful. So if you do have any more questions, do keep them coming in. I'll try and refer back to some of my questions in the meantime. Oh, wait, we do have some. Wonderful. Selena, did you have something to say? I was, we can come back to it later and take the audience yeah. questions first, but I was actually going to flip the conversation may, maybe to ask you a question, Lizzie, and also oh, um, Tommy, as two people who are PhD students and are kind of new, new in the academic environment, what do you think is most lacking and what do you think the people who are in the kind of tenured positions of power should be doing? What are we, what are we missing that we're not doing already? Mm. Okay. That's a do you want to go first, Tommy? Yeah, sure. I don't mind yeah, going. Okay. I think um, I think ugh, there's there's a quite a few things, but I think that something that could be done is um, kind of more assurance of the security that there is in a career in science. Um, it's a very difficult thing to think. Okay, like I spend years trying to get into a PhD, I'm probably going to spend years trying to get into a postdoc, and that's kind of not really a sustainable career. So that's a fear that I have personally, and I know that not a lot of other and PhD students have that we've worked really hard to get to this stage and it's, we'd like to carry on and get to the kind of stages and careers that other people are at but how do we do that how realistic is it do we quit now kind of that realism and the real life experiences and hearing those and being guided through applications and understanding I think seeing the applications are being thought out in the way that like you've said um, the question and um, discuss some hurdles we face that's really reassuring when you're applying to um, things like that that you're personal experience new individuality is being considered as you are applying to positions like that so. yeah I would absolutely agree with all of that that's really great um I think on a more personal level I think the day-to-day -day things that I experience as a woman in science as well um like I don't know men might just not see it happening it will happen in other careers as well I'm sure but it does seem especially to happen in science where everyone has this idea of an old white man with crazy hair as the scientist and that's still persisting um, but I do often feel personally that sometimes in meetings I'll be talked over and it's not given a second thought I'll be automatically presumed to be doing the emails for certain things and keeping notes um, and just little things like that they do kind of build up and become annoying and make the research environment not always particularly the best environment to be in as a woman and I'm sure people also relate to this um so yeah that's just what I'd like to have. number of times <laughs> I've been it's been assumed that I'm taking the minutes for a meeting yeah and um, <laughs> now I always give this piece of advice don't take a pen or paper to meetings don't even take pockets if it's a big group meeting and then you just can't do it and I should just apologize because I actually realized that Rick put that question in the chat as I was saying it out loud and then I stopped and it was like oh no I've stolen someone else's question so I'm sorry Rick for that Fantastic. I haven't seen Rick's question. Sorry. Oh, there we go. It's not. <laughs> yes, that's a great question, Rick, actually. I'll ask you all that directly. So what do we think is the single best thing that people in privileged positions such as men can do to help everybody else? Who'd like to go first? Tommy? Yeah. Um, call people out when you see what we're, that, the things we're talking about today. Call them out because it can be scary when you're already in a disadvantaged position to call people out and have to deal with the repercussions. If you're privileged, you're, the repercussions will hurt you a lot less. So feel free to call them out, pass the microphone along. You don't have to speak for a lot of people, but kind of touching, look around, like are people uncomfortable? Do I have the, like, the power to speak? And I think you use that privilege to do that. It's a really good question, by the way, like, and it's great that people yeah. are asking those kind of questions. Yes, this is exactly what we need. Um, Gina, would you like to add to that? Yes, I mean, I think the single best thing is a kind of generic, <laughs> is, is keep an eye on the inclusion as well as just the diversity. I think there's a, there's sometimes there's just a temptation to, well, if we've got, you know, a certain number of women in the room, that's fine, a certain number of ethnic minorities, whatever. Um, but I think if you're in a position, a privileged position, make sure those people are included and avoid what's known as the pink silo if you're talking about gender. Um, so, so, so that's, if you can oversee that and make sure that, you know, people, people's voices are heard, I think that would really help. Absolutely, I agree. Um, it can be quite hard because obviously there's so much gender bias ingrained in our society, but if you're looking out for it and you notice it, try to challenge it within yourself and other people. I'd say that's my advice. 
fab. I'll just look at the Q&A now. We have quite a few questions, so that's great. Um, yes, this is a great one. So does anyone know if universities have maternity leave policies for PhDs and postdocs? I find a barrier to staying in science is sometimes having to choose between a career and family. Who'd like to start off with this one? Gina? Have you got um, thoughts on I mean, yes, yes, they do. I mean, certainly if the PhD and postdocs are funded, uh, sometimes the funding bodies will include that. Um, and I think certainly <laughs> one of the very early things I did a long way back um, was negotiate maternity leave um, for uh, academic colleagues. Um, there was no paternity leave, so I negotiated that as well, <laughs> just to show we were balanced. Um, so I, I think, yes, I, I think it's much better than it used to be. Um, I think the problem is later, actually, um, and I think that's where the work-life balance, um, you know, fertility timing, if you like, um, as, is associated. And I, and I think it's not necessarily maternity leave, it's, it is actually coping with um, family demands, et cetera, which is, which is quite important. And I think the statistics show it's at that level that more women are leaving. Absolutely, yeah, that's a really interesting point. Fantastic. Um, I'll answer this question now. So it's quite a long question, but I'll pick out the question within it. So um, we have somebody that's concerned as a cis white feminist talking about women in neuroscience and just having that singular perspective. Um, and they're keen to make sure that more intersectional barriers are discussed as well, which I agree is very important. Um, I wonder maybe, Tommy, if you could talk a little bit about this, how you feel about um, the people that are talking about women in neuroscience. Yeah, so um, I think the most important thing that I found is that, that the discussion, if I'm having a discussion with another Black woman, our discussion is mostly around our personal experiences. For a wider impact to have, those discussions need to be had with wider audiences and the people who do surround the environment, because we're all part of a system. Um, and we're, we're, I think most people here agree that the system is flawed in some ways. Um, and I do think there are some there's some power that individuals have um, in like kind of dismantling certain parts of the system. Um, so I would say it is highlighting people who are having the discussions that you don't feel that you have personal experience to discuss and listening to them and knowing that you can kind of echo those in spaces where those people do not get to exist. Um, so for instance, a lot of, I speak to a lot of black women, they're not in this call now, but I will try and speak on some of the barriers that I believe that they face. And that's them kind of almost being in the room with me. So I think carrying different intersections along by listening to the conversations that they're having in and just being an observer in their space, if you're invited to it, um, being an observer in those spaces and bringing it to the spaces in which you exist is a great way to kind of advocate for groups that you do not necessarily belong to. That's fantastic, a really good point. Does anyone have anything to add to that? No, we're happy, wonderful, okay. Um, so next, I will ask about um, undergrad level. So somebody is particularly interested in ideas for improving access to neuroscience at the undergrad level. They've found opportunities to be very focused on internships, um, as we've discussed. Um, so what ideas do we have for addressing it at very early levels, the gender bias? Um, Selena, would you like to take this one? Yeah, I mean, my answer will also be slightly focused on internships, but around making internships more universally available. Um, so I did briefly mention the InterScience scheme, which is designed to catch people at kind of A level, just deciding to apply to university sort of phase. And they provide, um, I think, two week long lab placements. Um, that are funded and supported but beyond the internship they have a whole other range of support activities around things like writing um, the statement for university applications and again this ties in a bit to my sort of niche of the the working class background that I didn't know what to write in that and I didn't have anyone to ask either um, and so I think seeking helping people to 
understand what careers are available in science again for me I, I didn't know that there were things other than medicine and being a vet in, in science until I was maybe at a level stage and then you know providing information so people know what um, they should be thinking about when making those applications I know that Kathy Abbott is in the audience and I seem to remember maybe and I apologize Kathy if I've got this um mixed up but I think she also does a, a scheme where people can submit um the UCAS statements for a scientist to review. Um, I think I saw something about that on social media a few years ago, and I do, I'm sorry if it's not you, Kathy. Um, but yeah, so I think looking out for opportunities like that where we can help the community um, and increase the diversity of our intake at that very, um, that kind of very early stage. Mm, yeah, that's a really good point. Hopefully we can find the information on that. That sounds wonderful. Um, next, I'll move on to, yes, this question's got lots of votes. So when talking about gender biases and inequality in science, how can we make these discussions more inclusive for trans people and people outside the gender binary? Has anyone had experiences on working on this with their peers? So this is a really great question. And I did honestly really carefully consider how I should title this session and thinking about including non-binary in the title as well. But just because we couldn't find a panel member to occupy that subtype of gender identity, I didn't think that would be appropriate. Um, but I think it is extremely important that we do have um, more inclusive talks, including trans trans people. Um, does anybody have any experiences to add on working on things like this? Maybe Emma could add something here. Yeah, I'd just maybe like to add to this that in terms of BNA members, it's really important that we um, are aware of the kind of different needs of our members. So lots of the information when you fill in your member profile, um, some people, um, however you want to fill that in, it's, it's a more recent um, addition. So the data for that, if it's unknown, we, we just don't know about it. That typically means it's not been filled in. Um, if people put the kind of prefer not to say category, and that's absolutely um, your decision, it's a slightly different conversation that we are, are potentially having um, with our membership in terms of what we can do to, to support people and, and understanding the demographic of our membership as well, um, which is really important. And I think these conversations are happening, but I think we need to probably do more in this area. Um, there have been lots of work in, in kind of binary gender um, equality for lots of years, but we do need to do more in this area, I think. Absolutely, thank you. Um, there's another question for Emma here, I think, that's received lots of votes. Um, it's asking, are there any outreach opportunities for women in neuroscience supported by the BNA? Yes, this is an interesting question, actually, because in general, we tend to find that those outreach engagement opportunities um, predominantly are undertaken by women. Uh, and we find particularly in academia that these sorts of activities often aren't um, rewarded or, or recognised in the same way that, for example, uh, research outputs might be. So um, we do have a number of prizes. So the engagement prize, for example, within the BNA and the BNA is very keen to support engagement and outreach. Uh, in all sorts of areas. There are also a range of other um, organisations and places that support outreach. So the STEM Ambassador Network is a great network um, to consider as well. Um, it's also worth having a think about um, how the local environment that you um, might be in recognise and support those types of activities. So I know that Cardiff has a promotion pathway, for example, um, that does recognise that engagement uh, route. Uh, there is more work to do there and the, the difficulty is how do you measure that, you know, in terms of research output, grants, money and, and, and the, the star rating of papers is quite a well established um, mechanism to look at impact. It's, it's more difficult in engagement and outreach, but we are um, getting there. Um, the other thing to mention is those types of activities often occur on evenings and weekends, which can be problematic um, from an ED&I perspective as well. So sometimes it is just about challenging that and somebody I can just pick on another question while I've got the floor and um, kind of wanted to flip the conversation to more um, positive experiences and Selena I know you mentioned um, minute taking in meetings and I was in a scenario where I often took the minutes in a meeting. I actually to be honest hadn't really noticed this it was only when a male colleague said 
I'm really uncomfortable with Emma taking the minutes for the 10th time. I'd like to do them today. And genuinely within this meeting, lots of people hadn't recognized it. I personally hadn't recognized it. Um, but you know, that is just a fantastic example of just being more aware uh, of the situation as well. Yeah, that's really, really interesting. Um, I suppose you also talked about their women more likely being involved in outreach activities, which I would say is a very positive thing for us. We'd, of course, like more gender balance in that as well, though, um, because it is kind of a task that maybe isn't appreciated as much as specific scientific research um, and men perhaps aren't getting involved in those other tasks quite as much. So maybe that's something to think about as well. So. Unfortunately, that's all we really have time for in terms of questions, but we will be answering more of them over on the Padlet. Um, I'd like to finish with a question to ask all of the panellists individually. So I'd like to know what advice you would give to any young women out there interested in pursuing a career in neuroscience. So I'll start with Gina. <laughs> Remember thought that far back. Um, yeah, I mean, I, I think, um, just being aware of the issues is a help. I, I think don't be taken by surprise. Um, and in fact, you know, probably growing up as a female, you will already have encountered some of the, um, you know, the more general uh, uh, world experience that you will bring to science and that science will bring to you. So I, I think that's important. Um, find out about mentors, uh, really, really important, um, and, and, you know, really make as full use of them as you can. And, and that's mentoring and sponsoring as well. You know, you want somebody to help you and don't feel that, you know, you're, you, you shouldn't need special help. You, you do need special help until we do have this wonderful playing, much vaunted level playing field. So I, I think that's it, you know, be aware that there will be struggles, but there are people who will help and you should use that help don't withdraw and think oh you know i'm going to be looked on as a failure if if i don't seek help that's great really really insightful um i think mentoring is really important and also not to be put off by all of our chat about this obviously we're still here we're still neuroscientists <laughs> we're happy to be here most of the time there are just <laughs> these issues that um, ruin our day occasionally and stop our progression sometimes, but it's important that we're here and we're talking about it so we can improve it for all of you in the future as well. Um, did anyone have any other advice to add? Tommy, do you want to go next? Yeah, sure. Um, advice that I probably like echo in the mirror every morning as well. Um, still there, still trying to figure it out, but um, I would say to young women who are, neuros who are trying to get into neuroscience or science in general, um, just repeat to yourself that you do deserve to be here. You've worked so hard to even have access to this place and no one has the right to stop you from doing what you want to do. If you have an interest in it, please try and pursue it as much as you can. And also, um, you owe it to yourself to try. If you do want to leave in five years, it's up, that it's up to you. You can. No one here is going to judge you. Um, but science needs you a lot. So it'll be great to see you succeed. Amazing. I love that. Selena, do you have some advice to share? I think great advice already. If I maybe add one thing, I would say don't limit your mentoring and sponsorship network only to other scientists. One of my most powerful um, sponsors and, uh, you know, a mentor who's had the most, one of the the kind of biggest impacts on me is actually the CEO of a charity organization, completely not a scientist and just sees things through a slightly different lens that, you know, allows a different perspective to, to kind of come into consideration when you're considering decisions or problems. Um, so keep your networks wide. Perfect, wonderful. And Emma? Yeah, just echoing those comments really, and um, science does need you, and I thought a lot, um, particularly when I'm in a scenario where I might be the only woman in the room, I used to find that really frustrating and sad. I have done a lot of work trying to flip that, and actually, you know, what I say in that meeting is important and relevant, um, arguably more so. Um, so I would say that you have something to give, and, and your view, your opinion is, you know, absolutely as, as valid and as important, um, so back yourself. Oh, I completely agree. That advice is wonderful to hear personally, and I'm sure so many people on the call have really benefited from that as well. Um, I'll just share my screen again because I have a few resources to share with you. Um, there we go. Wonderful. Can you see those? 
fantastic. Um, yes, so to finish off the session, I'd like to make you aware of a few of these resources that I found. Um, to be honest, it's taken me quite a while to find all of these because they are a bit hidden in the internet. So hopefully there's some on there that you might not have heard of before. Um, I've included the BNA Brain Carer Grants that Emma mentioned on there. There's the Black Women in Science Network that Tommy's talked about and neurogenderings that Jean is involved with as well. Um, and yes, maybe you could take a screenshot of these. I'll also be hopefully sharing the slides on the Women in Neuroscience website as well, so that um, if you wanted to have a look at those later, you can. And yes, finally, I would like to highlight the new network that I've been working on since the start of this year. Um, I've built this website all by myself and the social media from scratch. It's been quite hard work, but I have been interviewing other female neuroscientists from a variety of career stages across the UK um, to join my team, along with Tommy, who's been an amazing advisor for me. Um, so hopefully they'll be helping me to kickstart this exciting new venture. So to my knowledge, this will be the first UK-based scheme that's designed specifically to support female neuroscientists. And we aim to be sharing blogs, social media posts, as well as virtual events to help connect and inspire females interested in neuroscience and try to foster collaborations between us. And as well as benefiting the audiences that come along, I hope the people involved with the team will also try and build their personal and scientific skills through this. So it could be really helpful, I think. Um, in the long term, I hope that this spreads across the whole of the UK. There is so much potential for it. And a dream one day is to have some in-person events as well as the virtual ones. Um, so for now, you can check out Women in Neuroscience UK via our website. There's the link at the bottom and you can also scan this QR code with your phone um, to bring you to the website. Um, you can keep up to date with all things Women in Neuroscience UK by following us on social media um, at women in neuro underscore UK. And we also have a mailing list on our website that you can sign up to as well. And we would love to continue the discussions that we've had today, which I think have been really insightful, interesting, um, given us all something to think about, to hopefully take back to our colleagues, our research environments to talk about on a more day to day basis as well. Um, so we'd like to carry those on um, on social media through the hashtag women in neuro. Um, we also have a forum on the website um, called gender equity, which you can chat within as well. And of course, the BNA Padlet. So that's been running for all of the BNA members meeting and you can um, see the questions that we didn't get time to answer and all of our panelists will have a look at those and try and answer those as well. Um, we'd also really appreciate if you could take a couple of minutes to complete our feedback form. I think Tommy's going to paste that in the chat for us now if possible. Wonderful. Um, so just so we can get an idea of if this session was useful and interesting to you and what we might be able to take forward to future Women in Neuroscience UK events. Um, I'd like to thank the panellists very, very much for coming along to this session. It's been wonderful to talk to you, and I'm sure the audience have really benefited from our chats. And thank you to the audience for coming along as well. Um, thank you for being interactive with us, asking some great questions and getting involved. Um, there will now be a 15 minute break before the programme returns for the rest of the BNA members meeting. Um, so that's it from me. Thank you very much for having us today. And we hope you enjoy the rest of the BNA members meeting.